Merciful Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you that in your grace and in your wisdom, you kept us alive and allowed us to see the beautiful year 2010. It's our prayer, Lord, as we begin this year, that we would begin with you. That we will spend the year with you and you will end the year with you also. It's our prayer that you would be with us as we meditate upon your word. Hide me behind the cross so that you and you alone will be lifted up. So that your children will be richly blessed, is my prayer in Jesus' name. I want to wish each one of you a very happy and a very prosperous New Year. We have a number of visitors worshipping with us this morning, and I want to extend a very warm and a very special welcome to you. Chance, thank you so much for choosing to worship with us this morning. Kindly turn your Bibles to Psalms 100, and I'm going to read verse 1 and 2. Psalms 100, verses 1 and 2. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Shout joyful to the Lord for all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. At the end of a long and a very profitable journey, a wise man was asked by an young man, Sir, what advice would you give me as I'm about to begin my life journey? The wise man thought for a moment, turned to the eyes, turned to the young man, looked into his eyes and said, Young man, I have three things to give you. Number one, Choose somebody who is going to be bigger than you in life. Number two, he said, take pride in doing your very best in the job that is given to you. And thirdly, he said, try to build something of lasting value. We are standing at the threshold of year 2010. God in his mercy and in his wisdom has allowed each one of us to enter into this year. The year 2009 has been a very challenging year for each one of us in all spheres of life. Economically, religiously, spiritually, name it. It has been a very challenging year. It has been a year of success and it has been a year of failures. It has been a year of encouragement. It has also been a year of discouragements. But as we enter into the year 2010, there is one thing that we need to keep in mind. That we cannot recall even one minute from the year that has just passed by. I'm reminded of the words of our first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru. On the stroke of midnight, on August 14, 1947, as he was about to address the parliament that was sitting there, entering into a new phase of the history of the, in, of the country of India, experiencing freedom from the rulership of the British. He looked into the eyes of the parliamentarians and said this, past is past. It is the future that beckons us. It is also very true in our spiritual life, my friends. The past, with all that has gone by in the year 2009, the mistakes that we did is, is gone for eternity. You cannot undo anything whatsoever. And just as Nehru said, it is the future that beckons us. Even in a spiritual life, it is the future of the year 2010 that beckons us to a more purer and to a more committed Christian life. As we enter into the year 2010, there's one important factor that you and I need to keep in mind. That we are one year closer to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether you accept it or not, whether you believe it or not, the fact remains unchanged. The year 2010 is going to offer you new opportunities, new challenges, new commitments. And it is my prayer that as we enter into this new year, that we would look up to somebody bigger than ourselves, which is our creator and our maker, the Lord Jesus Christ. The year that has gone by, the year that we face, as we look in, you find that all around the world, politically there is disorder. Socially there is hatred. 
Religiously, there is emptiness. Economically, there is doom. Psychologically, there is want of security. In an age of uncertainty, in an age of fear, anxiety, and even despair, the greatest need that you and I stand in need of is a need of a spiritual revival that will take us back to God, to the primitive religion where we will seek God first before we do anything else. This morning, I thought I would direct your attention to a very beautiful passage of scripture recorded for us in 2 Kings chapter 18. And there you find the story of King Hezekiah. He is at the age of 25. He is crowned as the king of Judah. And God chooses him. And when he enters into the scene as the king of Judah, you find that the country that he was ruling in and the neighboring country, the kingdom of Israel, comprising of ten tribes, were living in sin and corruption. In fact, politically and spiritually, the kingdom of Israel was in a rotten state. Despair, discouragement, dishonesty, deception, disobedience was the order of the day. To such a situation, you find that Hezekiah is asked to become the king of Judah. And you find that he begins to take a very serious look as to how he, is going to, how he was going to rule. Of the many kings that ruled over the kingdom of Judah, my friends, Hezekiah was one of those, the Bible says, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And at the threshold of his reign as the king of Judah, you find that in the fourth, in the fifth, and the sixth verse of 2 Kings chapter 18, you find three important admonitions. And I feel this as the three recipes as we begin the year 2010. And so kindly turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 18, and let's turn to verse 4. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. And if you look into the Bible very clearly, it says this. And he removed the high places. He broke down the images. And he cut down the gross. Three things he does in the fourth verse of chapter 18 of 2 Kings. You find that he completely removed the high places. Talking about places where the idols were kept. For you find that the children of Judah as well as the children of Israel, both the kingdoms, had given up worshipping God Jehovah and going after other gods. And so you find that here, the first thing that you find here that Ezekiah does is that he forsakes, he is willing to forsake his worldly ways. That's the first important recipe that I want to place before you for your meditation and for your consideration. As you begin this new year, a brand new year, unspotted, nothing whatsoever, I want to urge you to forsake your ways. Because when you forsake your ways, you will begin to seek God's ways. Because the Bible says very clear, King Solomon says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. To us as human beings, with limited mind, with a finite thinking, when you begin to look into the future, when you stand at the crossroad, when you make decisions, you think that you're doing the right thing. But finite mind as we are, weak and feeble and sinful as we are, many times our judgment, our decisions are completely wrong. At the end thereof are the ways of death. And so the most important thing that you and I must attempt to do as we stand at the very beginning of this year is that forsake your ways. 